Yeah, so my name is Ben uh, and I am a graphic designer um, and this is some of the stuff that I do. Um, so throughout my career, I've sort of had this kind of love-hate relationship with digital. In fact, to start off with, I hated digital. Um, like really, really hated it. Um, and this was something that I used to think when I um, sort of graduated as a designer. Um, I just felt like I wanted to do anything but digital. I wanted to do, this was my experience of digital at the time. It was like Dreamweaver and these horrible boxes and it was all kind of very, very difficult. Um, I wanted to be a print designer. Um, this is Anthony Burrell, if anyone doesn't know, and he's like a prolific print designer and I just wanted to be him. Um, Cause I felt like there was some like tangibility to, to print. There was like, you can touch it, you can kind of, feel it, you can smell it. Um, and I got my first job and it was kind of this sort of solving problems for charities and councils. Um, and I was like, this sounds great. I, you know, I want design to do good in the world. Um, at the time I was thinking, you know, I, I really want to work at the guardian or in journalism or do something that kind of has impact. Um, so I was like, yeah, graphic design can save the world. Um, so I got my first brief and it was design a website um which i had zero experience of at the time um so it was kind of a sink or swim experience for me um because i had less than sort of one percent knowledge of digital design um people were starting to think about this idea of ux and and user experience and what that means for websites and it was getting really really kind of scientific and i just i, I just wanted to design print um so everything that i did was was this um and i felt like it was impossible it was i just try and try and try and try and just didn't get anywhere with it i just didn't have that connection from okay print to digital how do you how do you kind of make that connection um i had this kind of brief love affair with digital um in my first job but then i kind of got frustrated and tired with it um and i decided to move from Cornwall, where I was at the time, into London, so that I could do print design. Um, but I got that job because I knew how to do digital. Um, but I ended up designing lots of websites for estate agents, um, and I got frustrated. Um, so I learned how to code, and everything changed from there for me. Like I finally had the connection between actually making and it coming into existence. Um, so I could see things were happening. I could design and then try and then design and then try. And the process started to kind of become a little bit more natural. So now in that process, I started to love digital design. Um, print was still there. Um, and I never lost that kind of mindset around print. So I started to think of digital design as kind of an editorial process. Um, and editorial design and digital are kind of very similar. You're doing kind of layouts, whether that's on a screen or whether it's on a paper, um, with a very user and kind of reader focused. You're wanting to try and convey a message. You're trying to make sure that the reader or the user understands the journey through the, the website or the app or, or the same way as you would be flicking through a newspaper. So there's some level of satisfaction that I started to get from this process of like being able to produce stuff, being able to design stuff, being able to code stuff. Um, and this brings me to, to working at The Guardian. Um, this, I mean, this, these, these slides are very much done for uh, this design conference, but this is um, some FAQs about working at The Guardian. So what's it like to work at The Guardian? It's exciting and frustrating in equal measure. Nobody knows how to spell. Um, do I know Barry Glendening? Nope. What about Owen Jones? Nope. Holly Toynbee? Nope. Anyone? Mostly editors even ever heard of. Now, it's sort of true that I work a lot with kind of editors and journalists and most people think like, what, what do I actually do? Because isn't the website finished? And I guess that's where me and my team come in, that we're 
thinking about kind of design and for a for a for something that's always changing like this is 24 hours on um the website so you can see that like there's probably about an hour where the site doesn't change you know we've got a whole team whole floor of editors and journalists writing about 500 stories a day um and so there's a lot of kind of movement on the site and a lot of changes always happening um and the process that we try and try and have is that we're kind of always balancing the editorial needs against the readers needs um and it's trying to find that kind of balance between the two um, because we got a lot of requests from editors saying, oh, we need to be able to do this. But then at the same time, we have to say, well, OK, is that going to benefit the reader? Um, and so these are some of the different article templates that we have on the website. Um, I'll talk more detail as to, you know, what, what, what these things mean in terms of the structure. Um, but these are just some of the kind of displays that we have. And yeah, so it's not just about the article, it's also about the promotion of, a, of, of those articles. So as Ian was saying, it's like the large and the small, it's also the different tones of the articles. So it's, is this piece uh, something from culture? Is it from, from news? Is it from opinion? And so, you know, the whole design language is based around thinking, okay, can we give a little nod to the reader to indicate what this story is about and which section it lives in and what's the kind of feeling and the tone that it's going to have. So in January 2018, um, we started this, well, actually, we launched this redesign. And so before that, it was six months of no holiday for Ben. Um, but it also meant that we were undertaking this gigantic kind of redesign, um, which um, started out as a tabloid redesign. So changing the size of the newspaper from Berliner to tabloid, which was quite a significant change because the Guardian was the only Berliner in Europe. So, you know, we had our own press. Um, so it was a very significant moment for the Guardian to, to kind of to say, actually, you know what, we're going to step away from this format that we've been uh, pushing for the last uh, 15 years. Um, and so we made the decision that actually this was a more significant moment than just kind of changing the size um, that, you know, these things don't come about very often. Um, and so um, we decided that actually it was a read, it was a rebranding exercise that needed to live across all of the platforms. And so we did a kind of digital and print redesign, which was the, the first time that anyone's managed to do kind of print and digital at the same time. Um, and the, so that, that process, I mean, it's been one of the best things that I've sort of been involved in. But beyond that, it's kind of the stories that we get to tell at The Guardian. Um, and it's this whole kind of process, the, the design process and the editorial process is all about telling stories. Um, and so across what, you know, across the Berliner size and the, and the tabloid size, I've kind of been involved in lots of the kind of big editorial moments of the last five or six years. So the Paradise Papers, Cambridge Analytica, um, the populism stories, and various different general elections. Um, and being able to kind of sketch something quickly, talk to a journalist, talk to an editor, kind of understand the story at a very basic level because we don't have any time. So, you know, generally I'll get briefed on a story on one day and then it will need to go the next day or two days after. Um, so this is where kind of the coding side comes in and being able to do that incredibly quickly um, is is a massive bonus. Um, this is like me coding in real time, obviously. Um, and it's that process of being able to just put something into 
the site and kind of push it live, make changes very quickly on the fly um, that allow us to do some of this kind of bigger, kind of more featurey um, editorial work. And these are kind of some of the things. So beyond the kind of templates and the the day to day, we actually get to experiment with quite a lot of um, interesting stories and video and different rich media. Um, so it's part of the job is to try and figure out a way of actually moving us away from print and um, kind of having this kind of digital first focus. So if someone comes to me with a story and says, hey, we've got this thing for Weekend Magazine, I sort of have to go, okay, but how is that going to exist online? What have we got? What images have we got? What video might we have? Can we sort of, what can we bring to the table? Um, so this particular thing that I'm going to talk about is, um, it's an article about deep fake technology. Um, and it was that example of, it was a story that was running in Weekend magazine. Um, and so they had this kind of print focused um, approach to it. And then I came along and said, well, actually, how can we do a story about digital technology for digital and figure out a way of kind of making that make sense? Um, so the idea was that we would take some examples of what deep fake technology does. Um, so this is Donald Trump on one side, and then it's Jimmy Fallon on the other side. And it's actually that kind of moment of revealing those two things, that it's actually Jimmy Fallon with somebody deep faking Trump onto his face. So as the user scrolls down, you get these kind of different little reveals, um, different moments of interaction. So you can get rid of the headlines that are over the face of um, Pelosi and um, it's trying to think of different ways in which as you know, you're scrolling through 2000 words of an article that you can have kind of different moments of, of uh, joy and interest and that, that really bring life to the stories. Um, because I think, you know, it's quite a big ask sometimes to get people to scroll through kind of 2000 words and stay engaged. And so we try and do that um, through different things. I mean, we don't do it for everything. This was like a part where they're talking about Nicolas Cage and the internet being obsessed with Nicolas Cage. And um, it sort of, yeah, just wanted to take over the screen um, with as many Nicolas Cages as possible. Um, and so I think the, the, the thing with these, if we did this for everything, then it wouldn't feel so special with the um, the ones that we do. But when we are thinking about kind of features, um, we really try and bring kind of some different elements to the page and, and, and be experimental within reason. Um, and with all of that, another part of my job is to make comps and to make the fronts of the website kind of feel exciting, feel interesting. So I end up spending a lot of time looking at Boris Johnson and finding different ways to to tell the stories that he's involved in and various different politicians. And these were some of the examples that we did when he first became prime minister, talking about kind of social care. Um, and one particular example is the, this is pre him coming into power and it was to sort of do a timeline of um, his different failings along the way as a politician. So one of those, if anyone remembers, was him getting stuck on a zip wire. Um, so I used that as a kind of device that as you scroll along, he also scrolls along with you. And any of the kind of more sort of inquisitive readers will be able to find that actually you can just keep kind of attacking him on the, on the line and then he falls off. So it's just a kind of little moments of, of joy throughout the, the, the stories that kind of keep it feeling a bit unexpected. And these are some of the other examples of talking about the, the fact of the kind of um, the water cannons, um, Brexit negotiations. Um, and so, Another part of the job is also to think about 
how the stories exist in the world of apps. So it's not just a website. Um, and recently we redesigned the kind of Guardian's Daily app, which is a replica of the newspaper, but in digital form. So this is kind of the, how, how the app looks with various different sections running down the front. And as you tap on it, you get um, the article. Uh, we did some nice typography for it, a new typeface, um, which is based on the Guardian's title piece. Some illustrations. Um, and yeah, so it breaks down in um, a slightly different way to our normal interface that you have one home screen for each of the, um, which have the different sections within the, the screens. Um, so you can swipe through the stories and then you tap and then you see a different article. Now we have a kind of color language for um, for the website and for the apps, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but it's basically that, you know, each color indicates a different section and it's just a little nod to help with readers and users navigating that particular process. Um, so you, when you're in the app, you actually just tap on the story and it kind of reveals over top. So we're thinking about different interaction patterns we're thinking about ways in which we can get readers to the stories quicker um, and to, in, in a kind of intuitive, um, as intuitive a way as possible. Um, and here is some of the, the way in which we were starting to think about it. So we you know, this is a daily app. So we were trying to think about how we can promote it in a way that makes it feel like it's part of your daily routine. So beyond the kind of actually designing of the the, the, the products, we also have to think about how do we promote these products? How do we talk about these products? How do we, um, what, what, what are we trying to say to the world? Um, and so this was a kind of little teaser video that we did, which kind of takes a normal life of somebody, um, maybe, you know, in the UK or in the US, um, and compares that to people who are currently, you know, doing a kind of protest in Hong Kong and those kind of different things that you might see in a in a somebody's daily life um, and the whole idea was the news agenda that fits yours um, and so I will just quickly switch over to my other screen which is So can everyone see that still? We're all good. Yep, we're all good, Ben. Cool. That's great stuff, thank you. Um, so that was a very quick kind of fly through me and the kinds of work that I do. Um, I'll talk more now about the actual process of the redesign and some of the details of the design itself. So this was a kind of little site that um, I put together after the redesign just to kind of pull together some of the thinking around the website and the different details in which um, we were thinking about so that when new people come to the Guardian or, um, you know, we just needed something to reference from because there were so many moving parts. I think we did the redesign in about um, probably less than six months. Um, so it was very much like designing on the fly. It was um, kind of thinking, you know, digital needed to keep up with print, um, but not necessarily be led by it, but certainly be influenced by it and vice versa. Um, and so the basic structure of the website is it's made up of a kind of series of fronts and articles. So front is when you land on the home page or if you go to news or opinion. And so you can see that across the top that there are some different colors. Um, and down those pages, they're made up of containers. Um, so culture, for example, here. Um, and these just allow a kind of grouping of stories um, and 
it's kind of by theme or at the moment you can see that the website is very much kind of coronavirus related so there are about four or five special containers at the top of the site which are related to coronavirus and um, which is something that we've been able to do for a long time which is just to add like a special display to the top which kind of gives that kind of impact and importance to a story um, and so containers are then composed of kind of modular um, blocks of stories um, so you can see on the left you've kind of got some smaller ones and then on the right you've got some slightly bigger ones and we have the, that kind of scale all the way down the page where it's kind of a waterfall of importance from the top to the bottom and that's completely controlled by the editors um, and they can just move stories around take stories out and they can see kind of heat mapping of who's clicking on what and what stories are being read um, so it's very much kind of done around the reader and what people are interested in as well as the kind of scale of importance of story um, so some of the like key things that we talk about we talk about images headlines the kicker is the little um, bit of text that we put in front of the headline the stand first and then some meta information um, and we have lots of different sizes of these cards so from very very small um, without an image, all the way through to the really, really big display, um, which we probably wouldn't ever use unless something really, really big happens. Um, you know, we probably used it for the London Bridge attacks um, and things like that. So it, it comes out occasionally, but, but not all the time. So we like to, to sort of keep that only to show the impact. Um, and then I was saying earlier about kind of tone of story. So we have um, this idea of tone and it basically is the different desks and within the different desks, you've got like, you know, the features writers and the sketch writers and, or just a news reporter. And so all of those different stories have a different feeling to it. And what we wanted to convey in the design is some way of, of referencing that. So with the opinion piece, it's got the person because often it's very like writer led. So you'll know Hadley Freeman or you'll know Jonathan Friedland. Um, and so, you know, we try and put the, the writer like more central to those pieces compared to a news story, which is very straight and it's often got um, kind of stock photography or something that's come through the kind of um the pa system so it's it's not necessarily got the best display so we wouldn't make it too big and then live we try and make it feel live it's got the kind of ticker um and so the, there's lots of subtlety to the design that we're thinking about in terms of okay well how do we make this feel alive and and interesting to, to readers um, and then that follows through into the actual um, article pages themselves. So um, you've got a kind of article, then you've got kind of features, and we use the colored headlines for features. Live always has the big kind of block color behind it, whether that's in sport or news or even culture. Um, then we have the reviews, and that has the review stars along with the colored headline. And they're all just little indicators to, to indicate, you know, there's there's a change here. And then the opinion has a slightly bigger headline with the, the byline like attached to the headline itself. Um, and then the interview, for example, has this kind of highlighted type. Um, and we have a template called the immersive, which is kind of very, very image led, which we use for kind of long reads and features. Um, and we also have a kind of display on the front, which we call a thrasher, which is a, a custom display unit, which the design team and my team often are kind of working in. Um, this is like an opportunity for us to build uh, something bespoke, often with animation to promote a story. So if you ever see any kind of those breakout slots on the website, it's that's what that's what they are. That's what they're doing. Um, 
and so obviously we have quite um a strict grid underneath everything because it's so modular so um we have this kind of 16 columns and then it breaks down all the way across to mobile where it becomes flexible and this is really really important for this particular structure because everything is moving and changing and so we want to be able to create that kind of structure all the time um yeah around this particular grid um and yeah so on mobile it then becomes a kind of fluid grid um and it's worth saying that we think about things kind of mobile first so we always think about designing something on mobile and then going up to desktop um so i mean if you're thinking about designing for digital in terms of news the vast majority of readers are looking at the news on their phone um slight shift away from the usual especially now um because people are maybe using their laptops slightly less um because sometimes you see during the day that people are looking at it on their laptop rather than the phone because they're at work um and so you know with the grid we also have this kind of spacing rule and typography rule um which is that everything that we do all comes from this idea of like tight to the top and then space below so that it gives a sense of structure so everything is hanging off the rule that's something that we say all the time so you're hanging it off the rule which means that you're putting very small amount of space above it and then lots of space up underneath and then this is something that is reflected on both the newspaper um, here so you can see it on the headline and then on the headline as well of the card on the front of the website and then also in the article which follows that same structure of tight to the top and then space below um, and this is like a kind of subtle thing that indicates this is the guardian and also that um you know that we we are giving it space but it's it's got that structure um and so we we have these kind of two expressions of the brand we have the the g and the guardian logo type um and you'll probably have noticed that we are one of the only people that puts the logo on the right hand side so the masthead in print and the masthead on the website the logo is always on the right and every other newspaper it's either in the center it runs all the way across the top or it's on the left hand side um so there aren't that many places where you'll see um a sort of right aligned masthead that is done with such um such structure <laughs> Um, it's one of those things that we just can't play with and we can't change. Um, it's even on social media, it's all right aligned. Even if it's in a circle where it's really hard to right align something, it's still there and it's just an indication of, you know, the Guardian brand. Um, we have various different typefaces. Um, Guardian title piece is the core kind of brand font um and then we have guardian headline which was a new typeface that we designed for the redesign which was kind of to try and give it kind of optimum legibility on both print and digital um so it's a little less blocky um and a little more delicate and it has the kind of space and the higher contrast that it needs to be able to work on both of those platforms as best as it can um, and then we have the title piece, which is very much a tight, like a, a typeface for headlines and for big, bold kind of displays of, of type. Um, so we use it for kind of brand um, campaigns and it is used in editorial, but we try and use it as little as possible just to give it a sense of, okay, this is important and, um, you know, it's a, it's a brand, it's a brand moment. Um, we also have a very um, legible text type. Um, maybe all of this is kind of some subtleties that um, the, the design teams um, will notice. But um, yeah, we have a, a text type, which is Guardian Egyptian, which came from the old set of typefaces, but it's very well balanced against the new headline. Um, and it still works very well for just like body copy. Um, and we also then use a kind of sans serif 
for interface type things so forms and buttons um you know because whilst the website is you know it's an editorial product and we're thinking about it in terms of editorial design we also have to think about it as a piece of digital product design so we need to think about things like forms and buttons for people to sign up and do the whole process so it's very much a kind of full fully formed piece of digital design um and so color palette we originally designed a very kind of contrasting um clashy color palette that was quite challenging and quite um out there for a newspaper um we spent a lot of time trying to think about the colors for the website because it's more difficult color in on screens because you've got to worry about legibility and contrast and various different um, screen types, screen sizes, density of, of lots and lots of different things. And so we had to kind of mute the color palette a little bit and bring it slightly more towards the, the legible side. Um, and we use the colors to aid the navigation. So news is red, opinion is orange, sport is blue, culture is this kind of golden color and lifestyle is pink. And the way in which we use it is within the kicker, or we have this kind of two-tone headline, or there are highlights to just kind of bring out key elements. And we also had to think about what is the kind of inverted palette. So what if these colors are working on, on black? Um, so in the end, we ended up with a kind of system where you kind of got a dark, a main, a bright, a pastel, and a faded so that you have that different range of, of color palettes for each of the different sections that you're in. So, you know, most of the things you'll see are using the main color palette, um, but then we are able to contrast that against the dark or the bright or use the pastel if it's on dark. Um, so it's it's quite, quite a simple system, but it took a lot of consideration and thought around or how do we make this work across the like vast quantities of stuff that we actually do? Um, and then on the other side of that, you've got, you've got the brand palette, which is the blues and the highlights and then neutrals and then some various other special ones. Um, and then sort of towards the end of this um, is that we have a couple of different usages of Things. So I was saying about buttons and we have a very strict kind of grid around those as well, where everything is kind of centered within a space. So it's centered within these imaginary circles. And I think, you know, whilst you might not be thinking about these kind of elements, it's worth know, knowing that, you know, we're really thinking about the details and thinking about every, every single little detail that we possibly can to make it feel as consistent and as, as unified as possible. So we, you know, we have a set of icons that are all designed based on the typeface. Um, and so, you know, most of those will you will only see in buttons, but it, again, it's that kind of UI editorial relationship. Um, and we highlight text and it's kind of important that we only do that in certain moments so that it's used for emphasis and never for like decoration. And again, that has a kind of, structure around it so how much space you put around those words so it's very very detailed um and then we have a kind of set of different rules so we do kind of byline ruling and then opinion rules and then features and sport and that's all these kind of subtleties that we put into the design to make it feel like there are some elements which change and that make it feel like okay if i'm going to read three stories I'm going to have this level of consistency, but there will be some things that make it feel slightly fresher and kind of uh, um, slightly different from each uh, particular type of content. Um, and so that kind of brings me to the end of the talking about the website. Um, and I guess now we can we can do some questions. The, you know, what what are the what are the principles that remain true 
whether we're working in print or uh, or digitally. And I've noted down just from what you've already said, um, consistency. That's something we've talked a lot about uh, with our students. Um, a color language, but uh, but also that attention to detail um, and uh, and the subtleties, which just elevate any design, don't they? From whether it's in print or or or, or online. Yeah. Um, or digital it's those little things that actually are sometimes invisible to to most people yeah um, but actually you know um, make all the difference between something that looks very uh, plain and ordinary uh, and something that looks very sophisticated and and is, and, is, and is actually saying something to 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 the reader i mean are there any other principles ben that hold true between no matter whether you're um, you know talking to colleagues on the print side or on the digital side, any other principles that actually just just make good design? Um, I would say that the the typography, especially within the world of kind of editorial design, um, whether that's kind of print or digital, the typography and the attention to detail within that is probably one of the most important things that you can focus on. Um, and that is just having kind of, you know, consistency in the way in which the line length is set, the the line height, the spacing between the, the lines, um, and just making sure that everything feels comfortable together. Because if you're kind of pushing and challenging the type too much, then um, you know, that's when it becomes a bit too uncomfortable for people to read. Um, and I guess that is exact, that's the same whether you're working in digital or, or in print. Um, it remains the one of the most important things that you can be thinking about. Okay, we've got a couple of questions uh, have come in uh, so far, Ben. Uh, this is from Olivia. Hi, Ben. How important is changing the font or the typeface of the masthead uh, when you're redesigning something. How can I change the typeface without losing the older audience of a newspaper, but also trying to attract a new audience? Um, yeah, well, I can sort of speak to that because we went through a quite a long process. Um, so we had a incredibly um, loved and um, yeah how do I describe it the Berliner typeface so the lowercase slightly rounded the Guardian logo um, was very much loved by its readership and so when we decided to change that um, we Twitter went crazy um, and you know we got comments like why did you let the intern redesign it? Um, oh my God, they're ripping off the evening standard, like lots and lots of different comments. So it is a really difficult thing to, to play around with. Um, but the thing that we did was we tried to, to give it some purpose and some, some reason why we were doing those things. So the reason we moved it away from being a one line was because we wanted to have more presence on the page. So we were changing the size of the tabloid so we felt like, okay, actually what it needs is it still needs to have that same presence. So it's a smaller format. So actually to put it on the two levels allows it to always have that kind of greater presence. So again, we're just backing every, every change up with kind of a reason. And um, the, the, the change in typeface was more about the kind of feeling of the moment. So. The Berliner typeface was designed sort of during this kind of Blair era, um, Labour Party government, and it felt like it had that kind of like sense of joy and you know prosperity, and though you know it didn't feel as challenging as maybe the logo type of kind of the Guardian needed to feel in that moment. So we decided to make it feel a bit more, um, a bit more pointed and a bit more sharp and a bit more like it had this kind of purpose to challenge and to feel like you know this is a different and more serious moment so that is kind of the way in which we did it was to to take some of the forms that we had 
to try and find something that felt like it still had that same feeling, um, but was just doing it for a different yeah. moment. Um, so I guess it's, it's very difficult and it's something that we had to take a lot of care over. Um, but we found ways to make it feel like actually um, there are subtleties that bring it back. So the weight of it is very much the same. Um, and it's based on the same typeface, just with some slight tweaks to the to the format. Um, but the the other thing to say on it is that if you make a significant change, it's very very quick for people to get used to it. Like we have lots and lots of feedback now of people not being able to sort of remember what it was like before because people adapt to those changes very quickly. So it was very considered from our side, but we also knew that people would would take on that change. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Ben. So it's much more than just choosing a typeface you like, isn't it? There's an awful lot more goes into it. There's a, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, yeah, and I think the most important thing is to always have a reason for those things, like always have a reason for the changes that you're making. Because if you're having those questions and those kind of, you know, we, we were having a very kind of public discussion around it, basically. We were saying to the world, look, this is what we are now. So we needed to be able to say when people said, well, why have you done that? We need to be able to say, because this is the way that things feel right now, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've got a question here from Matthew, which um, follows on from what Olivia is asking as well, actually. So, you know, when you are redesigning uh, something, whether it's a print newspaper or, or, or something else, with the purpose of attracting a younger audience, what do you think the most important changes are to make? And I guess this is true, particularly in newspapers, isn't it? Because most newspapers, even The Guardian included, you know, uh, have, a, have an aging readership. Yeah. How do we attract, even, even though we know younger people are interested in, in news, mm -hmm. how do we attract them to our particular products, whether that's in print or digital? I mean, what, what are the, are there any easy wins in terms of getting younger audiences? So really, um, it's a really difficult challenge. Um, and it, I think it's one that, um, that we're still facing. I think um, the, the simple answer is that it comes down to the stories and the way in which you pre present those stories and the, the actual writing. Um, I think the design plays an important part in, in it in that I think that younger audiences are very design literate um, and they expect a certain level and a standard of design. Um, so um, I think that the design needs to be to be really good. It needs to have that level of detail um, and it needs to be flexible enough to be able to be paired back and kind of brought up in different sort of levels. Um, I think you know, I've done quite a few different pr projects around this idea of how do you bring in a new audience, a younger audience, especially, you know, playing around with different media like Snapchat and Instagram and different things where you might be able to find those audiences. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it comes down to, to being able to present the stories uh, that that audience are interested in in a way that they find engaging um, because you know you're always balancing um, older readership against younger readership so if you can do the presentation of a story in a way that means that you can write about um, the environment in a very immersive and engaging way as well as what's happening in Westminster within the same style and the same system, then I think you're doing a lot to be able to bring in that audience, if that kind of answers the question. <laughs> no, it, it does, Ben, because, um, I mean, we of, often see um, publications online or otherwise trying to kind of import some of, you know, to import some of the stuff that we know young people are, are engaging with so that may be social media as you, you mentioned snapchat yeah. or or twitter or, or whatever 
is that a mistake? You know, is it a mistake just to try and say, well, hang on, readers, and, and trying almost trying to 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 trick readers into thinking that they're they're looking at social media when actually in, in reality it's it's a news publication that they're reading. I think the most important thing is to to, to be truthful and to be like truthful to the brand and to the organization that it is i think it would be um it, it you know there's a lot of trust that um you know we talk about trust a lot within the news and within journalism and um and it's really important that you're able to like to make people feel like you're a trusted brand so to, if we were to redesign um, the Guardian to look like a tech startup news desk, no one would believe the stories. No one would believe kind of that that, that was you know the brand that it, that it, it is. So I think it's about like understanding the context and understanding what what is the context that the particular brand exists within. Um, and maybe, you know, there are some other bits on the side, like, you know, you could rebrand like the cultural section or the features section to have a kind of slightly more young or cool or have a, whichever word you want to use. But I think it's keeping the core kind of true to the brand and then having those extra bits on the side that allow you to be brought into that. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, Catherine's got a question here, Ben. Uh, hi, Ben. What are the key skills needed to redesign uh, the the Guardian? Bas basically, do the work you did. Did you teach yourself to code? Yeah. So I mean, I, I think that's a, a great question. Catherine's asking really. I mean, what what are the what are the uh, core skills that are absolutely necessary to do the work that you do uh, with something like the Guardian? I think. Um beyond the kind of set of kind of core graphic design principles. So like understanding typography and spacing and layout. Um, I think they're, they're like the essential things. Like if I'm looking for a new person to join the team, I'm looking at those kind of basic sets of kind of principles. The next set would be a kind of understanding or at least the desire to understand kind of editorial and what that brings in terms of, you know, we're not we're not we're not designing brands. We're not kind of coming up with a small idea for a logo. We're thinking about how do you tell stories with photography and with type and with illustration. So it's kind of understanding that actually, um, you know, because it's a it's a slightly different type of design. You know, it's very much akin to how you would write a story. So there's there's that. And then on the top of that for, for digital is that knowledge of kind of digital and websites. So user flows and understanding that a website isn't just one page. You know, it's not just one page. It's actually a lots and lots of pages collected together that need to be able to be joined together. Um, so I guess they're the kind of the core skills um, and in terms of the the coding side, like I I taught myself to code purely because I didn't um, have great experiences with developers pre moving to the Guardian, um, and I think that set of skills just allows me and some of the other members of the team who have picked up some of those things like a level of speed. Um, and being able to to take a story and like very quickly put it into the world. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, thank you for your question, Catherine. Uh, Julie's got a question here about um, specific tips for designing features and lifestyle stories as opposed to new stories. I mean, what what are what are some of the differences that you try to to uh, to make to feature stories uh, at the Guardian? I guess um, the first thing to say is that news is generally told quite straight. You know, we tell the facts and there isn't much room for a playful design language or playful design within a kind of news story. 
obviously there are sort of news features but it's quite it's often quite difficult to do it within that world um and so that on the other side is that features then can be really trying to trying to lift the story so it all comes back to what what it's what it's saying and i think each component part of that so whether it's an illustration whether it's the typography whether it's um just the choice of photography it should all be trying to tell a part of that story in a different way so that they can all work together um so i guess a good a few uh, you know there's there's examples of those things where there's a video and there's some text and there's a gallery and then there's all of these different things within a story that are all doing the same thing so i guess the most important thing that i try and do is that i need to separate out all of those elements so that they're complementary because i guess the with features you know you can do some really nice typography you can do a really nice illustration but if those things aren't speaking to each other and to the story then that's when it starts to feel a bit kind of bloated and a bit superfluous um so yeah it's always making sure that you have a really good sense of what the story is trying to say um because that's where you'll find those ideas and those little like twists that you can you can put on something Great answer, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, something from Jizu Zhao. Uh, it's quite a specific one, I think. Um, but it's about magazine design, uh, Ben. I, I don't know. Have you have you any um, experience of of magazine design? And what would your uh, suggestion be in terms of uh, creating a, a magazine design that is that is original and, and eye catching to, to new readers? Mm. <laughs> that is quite specific. <laughs> um, I guess you've got a few different things. So it's the it's the tone of the magazine. You know, it's is this a kind of newsstand magazine? Does it have an opinion? You know, if you look at the different sets of magazines that we have at the Guardian, you've got Weekend magazine, which is you know a bit more lifestyley. It's got a bit of food in it. It's got a bit of fashion in it. It's got a bit of real people stories, and it's kind of a bit more on the light-hearted side. It still does kind of serious journalism, but it sort of has that feeling of it's it's going to be an easy read. And then you've got Guardian Weekly on the other side, which is very much kind of you know summing up the week's news in in, um, but it's got an angle. So when we're thinking about designing the different covers, you're always thinking about, okay, well, with Guardian Weekly, we can have a bit more of an opinion on, on what the story is. So you can kind of editorialize that image. Whereas on the side of Weekend, you kind of can't as editorialize it as much because it's, um, you know, it's got that kind of more lifestyle feel. So maybe it's more of a photography led thing. So I guess that's the first thing to consider is like, what is the magazine trying to say? Um, and then the other thing would be to to create a masthead for it that feels like, you know, that really sums up the magazine, that it um, that it has that presence and recognizability. Um, and then in terms of the spreads and the flow of the magazine, it's like thinking about the kind of density of the stories versus the features that kind of open out and become a like moment of, you know, it slows things down a bit. So it's it's pacing to, to stories uh, and to the layouts. Um, and I think for me, it's trying to find ways of introducing like moments of space. So like enforcing space on a, on a, on a, on a very dense layout. Um, is a really useful thing because it allows the text to breathe and it allows kind of for um, sort of easy reading experience. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Um, 
I've got, I've got a question, Ben, which is, uh, I mean, what is what is the the daily routine look like uh, in terms of the design team at the Guardian? I mean, how, and, and you know, how, uh, principally, how how does the print team work alongside the mobile team alongside the website team? What, I mean, so what 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 does it what does your day look like, and what is you know what is the day of people working in the design function look like um, at the Guardian? So. It's very different from print and digital. So print um, are working based on kind of editorial desks or sections. So they all have their own kind of art director that is working on a particular magazine or a section of the newspaper or the front page. So they're working on a cycle of day to day, unless you're a kind of features designer and then you might be working on kind of week to week projects. So Feast or Review Magazine, for instance. Um, and then in terms of the digital side, it's very kind of tech world structure. So it's um, different teams who are doing kind of sprint cycles of two weeks. So you'll have a designer who is working on the apps team, for instance, and they'll have a particular challenge that they're trying to solve, whether that's kind of quite small and pointed or whether it's quite big. And that will be taking place over a kind of two week cycle where they'll do some design work, some UX work, and then they'll hand it over to a developer who will then build it and then that gets released and then you start on the next thing. Um, so the, the, the two, those two worlds are quite different. But then there is like a sort of overlapping part of the job where you're working on a particular news story for the day. So then it's kind of a coordination between print and digital as to how we want to make an image for the website or how we're going to do a sort of special article and what are the elements that we can actually share between the two things. Um, so they are kind of, yeah, two different worlds that sort of sometimes cross over. But, but, but you mentioned earlier on, Ben, that it was mobile first. Yep. Uh, so how, how in, the, in those conversations, how does that manifest itself in terms of mobile being the, the primary uh, kind of driver? Um, I guess it, it's a really interesting question because I wonder if when you're working in that kind of world for so long, that, that is, it's almost an assumed thing of it's mobile first. So we talk about things through the way in which people use stuff. It's tapping and touching rather than clicking. And, and you know, it's all about gestures and swiping and understanding how people are thinking about the particular device. Um, so I guess it's more like, yeah, device centric. And that's probably the only difference because we still think of it as editorial design. So, um, you know, we the, the 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 conversations are more around the the feeling and the tone and the messaging than they are necessarily about the device or where in which it sits. Like you have your own kind of particular focus, whether you're on the apps team or working on the website. Um, and so you'll be able to kind of channel that into the different different areas. Great, thank you. Well, just a, a final couple of questions, Ben, and then we'll let you go home with your day. Um, this is a great question from Hansen. Hi, Ben. Do you need to analyze the click rate to review your design? As a designer, maybe it's important to satisfy audiences, but will you still hold some standards set by yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is a short, short answer. answer. Um, and the, yeah, the long answer is that we have a very good um, team of uh, data analysts. And so depending on the project, um, we will do lots and lots of rounds of testing and iterating on that particular thing. So we spent like a year and a half redesigning the header of the website, just the masthead. <laughs> and that was like release, test, data, release, test, data. And it was that kind of process. Um, and there is a very, um, there's always a tension between what data says 
what the audience says, what design want it to be, <laughs> what UX want it to be. So it is kind of putting all of that information together and that what that's what drives the design. So it's balancing all of those things together. But I think it is really important, the data side of things. But uh, for me, I would never let it completely drive the design purely because I think there is a level of kind of intuition and emotion that sometimes the data takes out. So it's definitely like blending those things together. Well, thank you, uh, Ben. Thank you for your question, Hans. So we'll, well, just finally, um, a question from me, uh, Ben. I mean, setting aside The Guardian, when you go out reading uh, either digitally, online, apps, uh, print products, I mean, wh where, where, what, what's your inspiration at the minute? I mean, what are you seeing that you think, oh, wow, yeah, I like that. They, 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 they really get this or they, they're doing this really well. Um... To be honest, I think in terms of news, I think the New York Times and particularly the New York Times magazine, uh, they do it like the best in the world. Um, the way in which they kind of have that focus on the stories, the photography is always amazing. The ideas that they get into the front pages of that particular magazine, um, and yeah just how they then translate that to digital i think it's like it's beyond anyone i mean it helps that they have like hundreds of people in their team doing it um but i think they are they are the best and i think beyond that the art director or the ex art director of that magazine uh matt wiley matt willie he is now a pentagram partner and he has kind of lots and lots of magazines that he does kind of himself self publishes on the side. And I think a lot of the output from that is like, it's always, you know, typographically amazing and interesting and kind of pushing the magazine world. Um, and I think that really informs my kind of thinking in digital because of the way in which it's, so design centered and so graphic design um is at the heart of everything um, and i like to kind of put that level of craft and detail into something digital that maybe in the past was like oh we'll just put things here and it's a website and it's fine um so i like to to reference print design in digital to get that same level of kind of design love Excellent. And, and finally finally ben in terms of your own work uh, are you um i mean what are you working on in terms of the guardian at the moment are you are you is there a another refresh redesign that's sort of slated in the the, the calendar already or or is that a little bit too secret to tell us at this point <laughs> at the moment um we are obviously we're all kind of going through this time together. Um, so I, we're, we're all remote working um, and we're all kind of focused on the day to day and making sure that the journalism is presented in the best way possible. Um, I guess kind of, yeah, like thinking about new formats and different ways to display the information. You know, we have a, a huge audience at the moment because of what's going on in the world. So it's an opportunity for us to try out different ways of presenting the news um, and presenting kind of stories to people. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite broad, the explore, exploration. Um, but yeah, there uh, hopefully will be some interesting stuff that comes out of it. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, that's been hugely helpful, hugely uh, inspiring. Uh, we, we love the work you do and uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to uh, to go through all that with us and to allow us to, to pick your brains. Um, so thank you so much for your time today, Ben. No problem. Yeah, it's been, okay. uh, it's been, it's been enjoyable. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you, Ben. All the best. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.